we're all packed and ready to go. The car is loaded with suitcases, snacks, and everything else we need for the road trip. The kids, Haley and Jack, are buckled up in the back seat, their faces lit by the soft glow of their tablets. My wife, Autumn, is beside me in the passenger seat, going over the route one last time before we head out. We're driving to Autumn's parents' house for the holidays, a place filled with warm memories and a much-needed break from our hectic lives. It's a long drive, about ten hours, but we're all looking forward to it. I start the car and merge onto the highway. Traffic is light, at least for now. But Autumn and I both know that it won't last. This interstate is notorious for bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, especially during holiday seasons. We've been stuck in jams that lasted for hours in the past. Neither of us wants to experience that again, especially not with two restless kids in the back. Remember last year? We were stuck for three hours because of that accident ahead, Autumn says, shaking her head. We missed Mom's dinner, and she was so disappointed. Yeah, I don't want a repeat of that, I reply. Autumn smirks and then starts scrolling through her phone. I'm looking at the traffic update. It seems like there's already a delay on our usual route. Want to try something different this time? I weigh the options. On one hand, the usual route is familiar. We know all the rest stops and gas stations along the way. On the other hand, the thought of getting stuck in traffic for hours with two kids who have the patience of fruit flies doesn't appeal to me. Sure, let's take a detour, I say. We could explore some new scenery, and hopefully, it'll be smoother sailing. Autumn opens the glove compartment and takes out an old map, one that's been in the family for years. It's more of a keepsake than anything, but it does show some alternative routes. She traces a line through a mountain range that will eventually lead us back onto the main road. How about this one? It might be longer, but it could save us time if the interstate is jammed. I nod, excited but slightly apprehensive about the unknown route. Let's do it. A little adventure could be fun. I hold the steering wheel tightly as our car winds through the narrow, twisting roads of the mountain range. I can't help but feel a sense of relief. We've successfully avoided the notorious traffic jams that plague the interstate during holiday seasons like this one. In the rearview mirror, I catch glimpses of our kids, Haley and Jack. They're busy in the back seat, their eyes darting around as they engage in a game of I Spy. It's a simple game, but it's effective in keeping them occupied. I break the silence, eyeing the empty road ahead and behind us. Are you sure about this route, Autumn? The absence of other vehicles has me feeling uneasy. She looks up from the map, locks eyes with me, and then glances at the road. Yeah, it's a shortcut according to this. We should be fine. However, just as she speaks those words... I sense something is off. The car starts to sputter, the sound jarring in the otherwise quiet interior. My grip tightens on the steering wheel. You've got to be kidding me, I say, almost in disbelief. I turn the key in an attempt to restart the engine, but it's futile. The car is lifeless, only offering a series of pitiful groans and clicks in response. We're stranded, here, in the middle of nowhere. I look at the dashboard, where the fuel gauge indicates there's still gas, and the temperature gauge doesn't show overheating. It's baffling. The car's radio display shows no bars for cell service, amplifying the feeling of isolation. Autumn starts searching the glove compartment for the car manual, or any tool that might be useful. What do we do now? she asks, a hint of worry creeping into her voice. I put the car in park and unbuckle my seatbelt. I'm going to check under the hood. Maybe it's something simple that we can fix. Haley and Jack, having caught on that something is wrong, pause their game and look concerned. Are we stuck? Haley asks. Yeah, why did the car stop, Dad? Jack adds. I open the car door and step out, trying to project a sense of calm. Don't worry, kids. We'll figure this out. Just a minor hiccup. I make my way to the front of the vehicle and lift the hood. Various parts of the engine are visible, but nothing stands out as obviously wrong. My eyes scan the array of components, 
hoping to spot something as simple as a loose wire or a disconnected hose. Autumn exits the car and stands next to me. Behind us, the back doors of the car open and close with soft thuds. Haley and Jack come around to join us, their faces reflecting a mix of curiosity and concern. The game they were playing is now a secondary thought, replaced by the immediate problem at hand. As we're all gathered around the open hood, contemplating our next move, a sound pierces the silence. It's faint, but distinct. Someone is crying for help. Jack turns toward the direction of the sound, his eyes widening. Did you hear that? He asks, the words tumbling out quickly. Haley, standing next to Jack, tilts her head to listen more closely. It sounded like someone yelling for help, she adds, her voice tinged with seriousness. A moment of hesitation fills the air. We're already in a difficult situation, and adding another layer of complexity is not what any of us had in mind. However, the ethical dilemma is clear. We have to check it out, I finally say, looking at each of their faces. What if someone is in trouble? What if they're stranded like us? Autumn nods, her eyes meeting mine. She understands the gravity of the situation. All right, she says, but let's be cautious. We don't know what's going on, and we're not exactly in a position of strength ourselves. I close the car's hood. The engine problem remains unsolved, but a more immediate issue has arisen. Let's lock up the car and stick together, I instruct, as I pull the car keys from my pocket and press the lock button. We all take a collective breath, steadying ourselves for what comes next. The cries for help continue, growing neither louder nor softer, as if waiting for us to make our move. We begin walking toward the source of the sound. Our feet crunch on the mixture of gravel and leaves that make up the forest floor. I lead the way, with Autumn following closely behind me. Haley and Jack are in the rear, their young eyes scanning the surroundings. The dense forest is imposing, with towering trees that block out much of the sky. Navigating through the forest is challenging. Roots snake across the ground, and the uneven terrain requires us to watch our steps carefully. I'm conscious of the fact that we're leaving our immobile car further behind with every step, but the calls for help continue to drive us forward. My ears stay tuned to the sound, trying to gauge its direction as we make our way through the wilderness. After about 15 minutes of walking, we reach a clearing. There's a sudden drop in the land before us, forming a steep hill that descends into a valley. I glance back at Autumn, Haley, and Jack. They look tired, but committed. The sound seems to be coming from down there, I say, pointing to the valley. We carefully make our way down the hill, using the trees and their roots as makeshift handholds to stabilize ourselves. When we reach the bottom of the valley, the cries for help are definitely louder, almost as if they're beckoning us to continue. We're now in a denser part of the forest, where the trees are closer together, making it a bit darker despite it still being daytime. We press on, driven by a mix of concern and adrenaline. My heart pounds a little faster each time the cries repeat, urging us to hurry. Finally, the forest starts to open up again, and we see the mouth of a cave in the distance. Just outside the cave is a campsite, complete with a tent, a fire pit, and some scattered belongings. There are no people in sight. I exchange a puzzled look with Autumn, both of us immediately sensing that something is off. I approach the campsite cautiously, my eyes searching for any signs of life or recent activity. The tent flap is open, revealing an empty interior. A backpack lies on its side near the fire pit, its contents partially spilled out. It appears abandoned, as if someone left in a hurry. Jack, who has been quiet for most of the walk, finally speaks up. This is weird. Where is everyone? His voice is shaky, a clear indicator that he too feels the strangeness of the situation. Haley chimes in, her gaze locked onto the dark cave entrance from which no sound emerges. Do you think the cries for help came from in there? She points to the cave, and we all turn to look. 
The entrance is dark, almost like a void, making it impossible to see what lies within. The cries for help, which led us all the way here, have now stopped. Something's not right. I don't like this. Autumn whispers to me, her voice tinged with genuine concern. Her eyes scan the abandoned campsite and the dark cave entrance, as if expecting something to leap out at any moment. The air is heavy, almost oppressive, making her words feel even more urgent. Before we have the chance to search more, a creature steps out from the cave's dark mouth. Its body is primarily covered in scales, each about the size of a coin, with a greenish-gray hue. These scales overlap tightly, giving the appearance of a tough, durable armor. Among the scales are patches of coarse brown fur that seem oddly out of place, but equally menacing. Its eyes are the most striking feature, a deep, penetrating yellow with vertical slit pupils that seem to focus with unnerving precision. These eyes are set into a head that combines elements of both a reptile and a mammal, complete with a snout that looks almost canine. Sharp, jagged teeth are visible when it opens its mouth. The creature's limbs are stout but look incredibly strong, ending in clawed hands and feet that have both the dexterity of a primate and the lethal sharpness of a bird of prey. Its tail is long and tapering, covered in the same greenish-gray scales that cover its body. The tail moves in a slow manner, as if it has a life of its own. Then, when it opens its mouth, out come the cries for help we've been following, perfectly mimicked in a human voice that sends shivers down my spine. Run! The word bursts from my mouth almost involuntarily. Without a second thought, we all spin around and bolt back in the direction we came from, our feet pounding against the forest floor, and adrenaline surges through my body. What was that thing? Jack manages to gasp out between labored breaths as we run through the thick underbrush. I don't know, Haley shouts back. As we dash through the forest, the unsettling sound of footsteps begins to reach our ears. The creature is pursuing us, and by the sound of it, gaining ground. Each step it takes seems to resonate with a terrifying clarity, cutting through the natural sounds of the forest and amplifying our fear. But then, almost as suddenly as it started, the sound of the creature's footsteps stops. The absence of noise is almost as terrifying as its presence had been. Nevertheless, we don't risk a backward glance, not even for a second. Our singular focus is on putting as much distance between us and that thing as possible. Finally, we burst out of the forest and back onto the gravel road where our car is parked. Our faces are flushed, our breaths coming in ragged gasps, but relief washes over us. We've made it back, but the car is still immobile and the creature is still out there. We can't stay here, Autumn says, her eyes filled with a sense of urgency. She quickly unlocks the car and motions for Haley and Jack to get inside. That thing might come for us, and we can't take any chances. But the car won't start, I remind her, my eyes shifting between the useless ignition and the dense forest from which we just escaped. And we don't have any cell signal out here. We're cut off. We have to do something, she insists, her voice tinged with a mix of fear and determination. We're sitting ducks out here, and I don't want to think about what that creature could do if it finds us. I look at the car, its hood still popped open in a futile display of mechanical hope, then back at my family who are now inside the vehicle. Their faces are flushed, eyes wide with a mixture of relief and lingering fear. Okay, let's go through our options, I start, taking a deep breath to steady myself. We heard that thing mimic human voices, so it lured us to it. We can't fall for that trick again. It's smarter than we initially thought. I grab the folded map from the glove compartment and spread it out on the hood of the car. There's got to be a nearby landmark or something where we can wait it out. A place that's easier to defend or more public where someone might pass by. Autumn joins me, scrutinizing the map with a renewed focus. Yes, maybe a ranger station 
or even a main road that's closer than going back through that forest, she suggests. Exactly, I agree, my finger tracing possible routes on the map. Our main goal is to put distance between us and that creature, but also to find a spot where we have the advantage, or at least where we're not as exposed. There's a cabin not too far from here, maybe a mile or so, she says, pointing to a small square symbol on the map. We could make it if we stick together, and it's in the opposite direction from where we encountered that creature. So, we walk to the cabin, barricade ourselves in, and wait until morning, I ask. It's our best shot, she replies. I glance at the darkening sky. It's clear that nightfall is approaching, and with it, increased danger. All right, we stick together, and we don't respond to any voices we hear, no matter how human they sound, I say firmly. I lock up the car one more time, securing it as best as I can, despite knowing it's far from foolproof. We each grab whatever can be used as an impromptu weapon. I take a tire iron from the trunk, Autumn picks up a hefty flashlight, and the kids arm themselves with large sticks from the ground. It's not much, but it's better than nothing. Turning to face the forest, we start our trek in the direction Autumn identified as leading to the cabin. The air around us is thick with tension, each snap of a twig causing us to jump, each rustle in the bushes making our hearts pound. All the while, in the back of our minds, is the chilling awareness that the creature is still out there, somewhere in the dark, watching us and perhaps plotting its next move. As we move through the forest, the ground is uneven, covered with leaves and broken branches. The sky is a dark blanket above us, providing no light. I hold the tire iron tightly, its cold metal offering a small sense of security. Keep close, I tell my family, keeping my voice low. Our eyes scan the darkness in all directions, ears straining to catch any sound that isn't a part of the forest's natural soundtrack. Since we left our car, the woods have been quiet, eerily so. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Jack tense up. I see it, he whispers, his finger pointing to where the forest is darkest. Following his direction, my eyes lock onto the creature. It's there, almost blending into the shadows, its eyes glowing in a way that chills me to the core. It stays still, watching us, but not advancing. Why isn't it attacking? Haley's voice is shaky as she grips her stick, knuckles turning white. I don't know, Autumn says, her voice equally tense. Her eyes are locked on where the creature stands. Don't let your guard down. It's toying with us. With a shared glance, we increase our pace, moving as quickly as the rough terrain allows. But even as we distance ourselves, there's a feeling of being watched. The forest itself seems to be closing in on us. Each rustle in the bushes raises the hairs on the back of my neck, and each snap of a twig underfoot sounds like a gunshot in the quiet. Finally, the shape of the cabin comes into view through the trees. The cabin is small and clearly has seen better days. The wood siding is weathered and moss clings to parts of the roof. As we get closer, I notice that the windows are coated with a layer of grime. With a cautious push, the front door creaks open on rusty hinges, revealing the dark interior. We waste no time entering and immediately set to work barricading the door. An old wooden table is propped against it, and chairs are stacked on top for added stability. Autumn looks around, taking stock of our surroundings. Let's check for supplies, she says, her eyes scanning the dimly lit space. We need to know what resources are available to us. The cabin is divided into a few small rooms. I head toward what appears to be a kitchen area. I open cupboards and find a modest stash of canned food and bottled water. The labels are faded, but it's better than nothing. Jack is already rifling through a drawer, and he pulls out a first aid kit. Haley, meanwhile, has found a closet filled with blankets and some winter clothing. She drags a couple of blankets out, spreading them on the floor. It's not a bed, but it's better than the cold ground outside. Then, 
I find a radio tucked behind some books on a shelf covered in dust and cobwebs. Maybe we can call for help, I say. I take the radio off the shelf and set it on a nearby table. With careful fingers, I turn the knobs, trying to find the emergency frequency. Hello, can anyone hear me? I speak into the radio transmitter. The machine crackles back at me, spitting out bursts of static. For a moment, a voice breaks through, but it's muffled and distorted, making it impossible to understand. Damn it, it's not working properly, I mutter, my fingers tightening around the device in frustration. Then we hear it, a sound that chills us to the core. It's the creature's call, but this time it's not just mimicking any cry for help, it's mimicking my voice. The words, hello, can anyone hear me, echo back to us, a grotesque imitation of the plea I just made into the radio. Autumn looks at me, her eyes filled with a mix of fear and disbelief. We can't stay here, she says, her voice barely above a whisper, as if she's afraid the creature might hear her even from this distance. I pause, considering our options, which seem to be dwindling by the minute. We have no other choice, I finally say. It's pitch black outside, and we're not familiar with these woods. The idea of venturing back into that dark, unknown terrain, especially with that creature lurking, is unthinkable. We've barricaded the door, and we have some supplies. Our best option is to wait here until morning. The night stretches on, each minute feeling like an hour. We've arranged ourselves in a circle. Autumn and I take turns keeping watch while the others try to rest. Even during my turn to sleep, I find it hard to relax, my senses on high alert for any sound that might indicate the creature is approaching. During Autumn's watch, she nudges me awake. Do you hear that? She whispers. I strain my ears and catch the faintest rustling outside the cabin. We all hold our breath, but after a few tense moments, the sound fades away. Haley and Jack are bundled up in the blankets we found, eyes wide open and staring at the ceiling. Despite the exhaustion that's setting in, sleep is a distant dream for them, too. It's going to be okay, I tell them, but the words feel empty even as I say them. The uncertainty of our situation hangs heavy in the air. As dawn begins to break, the sky outside turns from black to a muted gray, and then finally, to the soft light of morning. Relief washes over me. We've made it through the night, and the creature didn't attempt to get in. We're tired and scared, but we're alive. We need to make a plan, Autumn says, unfolding the map once more. Once it's full daylight, we should head back to the car. We can't stay here. I nod in agreement. We'll need to be quick. Grab only what's necessary. We open the cabin door cautiously, half expecting the creature to pounce on us the moment we step outside. But the area around the cabin is empty. The early morning light filtering through the trees gives the forest a peaceful appearance, sharply contrasting the fear that lingers in our hearts. I take the lead, tire iron still in hand, and we start making our way back to the car. The path is as we remember it, marked by the occasional broken branch or flattened patch of grass where we had walked the previous night. I keep scanning the surroundings, alert for any sign of movement. Stay close, keep your eyes open, I remind everyone, although it's hardly necessary. We're all on edge, waiting for that rustling in the bush or that eerie call that signals the creature's presence. About halfway to the car, Autumn freezes and grabs my arm. Look, she says, pointing toward a clearing. There, in the middle, are our footprints from last night, unmistakably circled by another set of tracks, those of the creature. It's a chilling sight, proof that it was stalking us, possibly planning its next move. We don't waste time pondering what might have been. Instead, we quicken our pace, each of us quietly praying that we'll reach the car without incident. Finally, after what seems like an eternity, we arrive at the car. It's just as we left it, the hood up and the doors locked. 
The first thing I do is try to start the engine again, still holding on to the faint hope that it was a temporary issue and that we'll hear the comforting sound of the engine roaring to life. But after several attempts, it's clear that's not going to happen. The car is dead, and we're stranded. Can't you fix it? Jack asks, a hint of desperation in his voice. I shake my head, frustrated and tired. I've tried everything I know. We don't have the tools or the parts to fix it here. Autumn takes out the map again. So, what's our next move? We're sitting ducks if we stay here, but we can't keep running aimlessly in the forest either. I look at the map, studying the web of lines and landmarks. There's a main road about two miles to the east of here. It's a long walk, especially through unfamiliar terrain, but it's better than staying here. We start gathering what supplies we can carry, bottled water, canned food, and a first aid kit. As we prepare to set out, I can't shake the feeling that we're still being watched. The creature has been eerily absent since we left the cabin, but the thought that it might reappear at any moment keeps us all vigilant. Ready? I ask, meeting each pair of eyes. Ready, they reply in unison. With one last glance at the car and the woods that house the creature still lurking somewhere in the shadows, we begin our trek toward the main road, uncertain of what awaits us, but united in our determination to survive. It's going to be a long walk, but staying is not an option. As we move through the dense forest, my senses are on high alert. My eyes scan the terrain, jumping from shadow to shadow. Then I see them, two spots of light reflecting in the distance. Those eyes, alien yet eerily familiar, confirm that the creature is still there, following us, but not closing the gap. Autumn walks beside me, gripping a sturdy branch as a makeshift weapon. She feels it too, the palpable sense that we are not alone. She is tense, eyes darting around, mirroring my own vigilance. The creature is clever, choosing to lurk just beyond our immediate view, making its presence known without directly confronting us. The kids are doing their best to be brave, but their faces are pale and their eyes are wide with fear. They too are aware that the creature remains in pursuit, maintaining its distance. They look to Autumn and me for assurance, but what can we offer? Every so often, there's a rustle in the trees, a shaking branch, a moving shadow that sends a chill down my spine. The creature is adept at reminding us of its presence. It wants us to know it's there, close yet not close enough for us to do anything about it. A sick power play that has us at a disadvantage. Even the forest seems to acknowledge the creature's stalking tactics. Birds that were chirping earlier are now silent. The wind that was a mild relief has died down, as if even nature itself is holding its breath. Everything is eerily calm except for our footsteps and the distant occasional rustling that reminds us the creature is still out there, watching. We need to keep moving, Autumn says, breaking the silence. Her voice is firm, but tinged with an urgency that she doesn't need to articulate. We all know why we have to continue. Standing still is not an option when you're prey. As we move forward, I feel a sense of dread settling in. The creature is toying with us. It's a predator playing a psychological game, one that it's winning. It's eroding our sense of security, bit by bit, never allowing us to forget that it's there, always in the background. The fear is no longer just about the creature's physical threat. It's the emotional toll that its stalking is taking on each of us. After hiking for what feels like hours, Haley points out something in the distance. Look, an old fire tower, she says. That could be our chance to call for help, Autumn says, her eyes lighting up for the first time in a long while. Let's go. Good find, Haley, I say, feeling a small sense of relief. Autumn is already heading toward it, her steps more energized, and I follow suit. The tower looms above us, a possible sanctuary in this maze of peril. As we get closer to the tower, I'm intensely aware of our surroundings. Every fiber of my being expects the creature to leap at us, especially now that we might have a way to escape this nightmare. But strangely, 
all remains quiet. No rustle in the trees, no eyes reflecting in the shadows. I grip the tire iron tighter as we start to climb the wooden steps, each step creaking under our weight. The door to the tower looks old and worn, but is thankfully unlocked. With a wary glance back at the dense forest behind us, I push the door open. It creaks loudly. For a moment, I worry that the sound will attract the creature, but there's no turning back now. We step inside and shut the door behind us, locking it as best we can. The interior of the tower is sparse but functional. Dusty windows offer a panoramic view of the forest below. A table and chair are set up near the windows, and most importantly, a radio is on the table. Look, Autumn says, pointing at the radio. Maybe we can finally get some help. I rush over to the radio and start fiddling with it. Let's see if this thing works, I mutter, adjusting the knobs and hitting the power button. Static fills the air, loud and grating, but it's a hopeful sound. I switch to the emergency frequency and grab the microphone. This is an emergency. We need help, I say, my voice tinged with both hope and desperation. As I release the microphone button, waiting for a response, that's when we hear it. The creature's call pierces the air, mimicking my voice from moments before. This is an emergency. We need help, it says, in a twisted, nightmarish version of my own voice. A chill goes down my spine. It's close, maybe even right below the tower. Just as I'm starting to think nobody will answer, a voice comes through the static. This is Ranger Station Echo. Who is this? We're a family lost in the mountains, I respond, relieved to hear another human voice. We're being stalked by some creature. We need urgent help. The voice from the station takes a serious tone. Understood. We can send a rescue team, but they won't be able to reach your location until morning. Can you hold out until then? Before I can respond, we hear it. The unmistakable sound of footsteps on the wooden steps outside the tower. My heart drops. The creature is climbing the stairs, coming for us. It's no longer keeping its distance, it's closing in. Before any of us can react further, a loud crash reverberates through the tower. The creature has reached the door and is ramming against it as if trying to break it down. Panic sets in, and my eyes dart around the room and spot a flare gun in an open cabinet. We have no choice. We have to hold out, I say, quickly grabbing the flare gun. I switch the radio off and set it down on the table, then turn to my family. Hold on, everyone, I declare as I aim the flare gun at the door. The creature bursts in, making a beeline toward us. Its eyes meet mine, and what I see chills me to the core a kind of calculating intelligence that seems almost human. My finger squeezes the trigger, releasing the flare. A trail of light and smoke shoots out, streaking across the room and creating a red, fiery glow. The creature lets out an ear-piercing scream, a sound of surprise and pain, before rapidly retreating back down the stairs. I return to the radio, my hands still shaking but a newfound determination steadying my voice. Heading out now, I inform the ranger, pressing the transmit button. We'll be waiting. We'll be there, the voice assures me. Then the line goes dead, leaving us alone in our high-altitude prison. The room is filled with a stifling silence. The tension is almost unbearable, like a thick fog that settled over us. We're safe for the time being, but outside the darkness continues to fall, and with it, the unknown dangers that come with the night. We have to wait until morning for rescue, holed up in this wooden tower. The creature is still out there, stalking the dark, possibly planning its next move. It's an unnerving thought, and it makes the walls of the fire tower feel like they're closing in on us. Understanding that we have no other choice, we settle in for what promises to be a long, harrowing night. We distribute the blankets that we found in the tower's supply cabinet, wrapping them tightly around ourselves for both warmth and a small sense of security. As the hours drag on, we all sit in the cramped space of the fire tower. The walls are made of aged wood 
that groans with the wind. The room is illuminated only by a single lantern in a corner. The light casts tall, flickering shadows on the walls, making the atmosphere even more unsettling. To pass the time and keep alert, we decide that each of us will take shifts to watch for any signs of the creature. Who wants to go first? My voice comes out softer than I intend, revealing my exhaustion. I'll do it, Autumn offers without hesitation. She moves towards the window, placing a rickety chair in front of it. In her hand is a tire iron, which she holds firmly. Her eyes watch the tree line and the empty space below, looking for any movement. The rest of us try to make ourselves comfortable, which is easier said than done. We pull the blankets tightly around us, each lost in our own thoughts. The room is chilly, and the blankets offer little warmth. Still, they provide a sense of security, however false it may be. Haley and Jack are the first to succumb to sleep, their eyes closing despite the threat outside. A couple of hours into the night, I feel a gentle nudge on my arm. I open my eyes to see Autumn standing next to me. Your turn, she whispers. I nod, pushing aside the blanket to take her place at our makeshift watch post. As I sit down on the chair positioned near the window, my eyes meet the black expanse outside. The darkness is almost absolute, and my eyes strain to discern any shape or movement. Still, it's not completely quiet. I hear the occasional rustling of leaves or branches snapping. There's even the brief flicker of reflected light far in the distance. It's a subtle reminder that we're not alone. The creature is still out there, its presence like a weight, lurking in the shadows and watching our every move. Jack stirs from his spot on the floor and makes his way toward me. He sits down on an adjacent chair, rubbing his eyes with the back of his hands. What do you think it wants? He asks, his voice tinged with a palpable mix of curiosity and fear. I look at him and then back out into the darkness before answering. I wish I knew. My voice is low, almost drowned out by the wind howling outside. Maybe it's territorial, defending its space from intruders like us. Maybe it's curious, wondering what these strange beings are doing in its home. Or maybe it's just malicious, enjoying the fear it's instilling in us. We both fall silent, each lost in our own thoughts, trying not to imagine what this creature might be capable of. The room is tense, filled with an air of uncertainty. We sit together, Jack and I, facing the dark abyss outside the window, listening for any sign of the creature. Our ears are attuned to the subtlest of sounds, be it the creak of the wood under our weight or the far-off hooting of an owl. Finally, after hours that stretch on like an unending road, the first hints of dawn start to illuminate the horizon. The sky transforms from a pitch black to a lighter shade of gray. The night has been a marathon of nerves and terror, but now a small yet significant sense of relief begins to seep into the room. It's as if the rising sun brings with it not just light, but a sliver of hope that we might make it out of this ordeal. That sliver of hope enlarges into a full beam when our ears catch a sound that cuts through the morning air, a mechanical thumping that gradually grows louder. It's the unmistakable sound of helicopter blades rotating at high speed. It's here! The rescue helicopter is here! Haley shouts. She points a trembling finger toward the tower window, where we can now see the approaching helicopter. We all rush to the window to look for the helicopter in the sky. Our faces press against the glass, our eyes wide with a mixture of disbelief and gratitude. It's real. It's not a figment of our imaginations. The helicopter is getting closer, and we can now make out its details. It's a large aircraft, designed for rescue operations, with visible markings that identify it as part of the Ranger Service. As the helicopter lowers itself toward a clearing in the distance, relief washes over us like a cleansing tide. It's so close, just a few hundred meters from the fire tower. I can see the pilot in the cockpit and the rescue team preparing to disembark as soon as the aircraft lands. The spinning blades send ripples through the tall grass of the clearing, 
flattening it in a circular pattern beneath the machine. For the first time in what feels like forever, we allow ourselves to smile, to exhale, to release the pent-up anxiety that has kept us on edge. The looming threat of the creature, although not gone, seems less imminent with the arrival of help. We exchange glances, each of us seeing the same emotion mirrored in the other's faces. A sense of overwhelming relief mixed with disbelief that rescue is actually happening. We gather our sparse belongings, putting on jackets and shouldering small bags. Each of us knows that leaving the tower means stepping back into the territory of the unknown creature, but the sight of the rescue team on the ground gives us the courage to face that risk. We scramble aboard the helicopter. Every buckle clicked and strap tightened feels like a small victory, a step away from the nightmare we've survived. The seats are cushioned, a comfort we hadn't realized we missed until now. The helicopter's interior is filled with the sound of rotating blades. The moment the helicopter lifts off the ground, a collective sigh of relief escapes our lips. We're airborne, ascending higher and higher, putting distance between us and the creature that has stalked us. I look out the window and see the trees and rocks of the mountain range growing smaller. As we rise, I'm flooded with questions that have no answers. How many other people have crossed paths with this creature? How long has it been lurking in these isolated mountains? One question lingers more than the rest. What kind of creature is capable of instilling such dread? As we continue to ascend, I keep my eyes on the landscape below. For a moment, I spot a small, dark shape moving between the trees. Is it the creature? It's hard to tell from this altitude, but eventually, the shape becomes indistinguishable from the rest of the forest. The creature is now a minuscule speck in the grand scheme of the wilderness, and then it vanishes altogether.